নিয়ে বসে আছে দেখছেন হ্যালো এন্ড ওয়েলকাম एवरीवन টু অ্যানাদার অফ আ সেশন এট ভয়েজেস ইন টু দা পাস অ্যাজ ওয়ে প্রমিসড আর্লিয়ার টুডে উই হ্যাভ উইথ আস প্রফেসর রণবীর চক্রবর্তী we all know professor chakravarti has taught ancient indian history at jawaharlal university new delhi for decades apart from jnu professor chakravarti has also been associated with a number of institutions including calcutta university bardwan university vishwabharati vishwavidyalaya and miami international university professor chakravarti has also authored several books including prachin bharater arthnaitik itihaser sandane and exploring early india an enlarged and revised edition of his much acclaimed book trade and traders in early indian society has recently been published by manohar professor chakravarti has also edited history of bangladesh early bengal in regional perspectives up to circa 1200 ce with abdul momin choudhury which has been published by asiatic society of bangladesh in two volumes besides professor chakravarti has also edited trade in early india and indian civilization as for school his forthcoming publication the full was the post and other essays is going to be published by primus books today from the chakravarti shall speak on urbanization in early india circa 600 bce to 1300 ce without much delay i would like to uh, pass the baton to professor chakravarti himself over to you sir Thank you very much. My most sincere appreciation to the organizers of this uh, discussion session. I'm indeed very delighted and very thankful for asking me to discuss a few uh, aspects of urbanization in early India from the period circa 600 BCE to 1300 CE. Uh, my main interest in studying the history of urbanization in the subcontinent is to look for the to look beyond the hackneyed rather stereotypical description that the subcontinent is essentially a society steeped in ruralism yes no doubt that the subcontinent has been for a very very long period noted for its agrarian settlements and the largest number of people depend on agriculture but there were distinct traces of cities and the urban culture urban activities and to which we should pay attention to as we know in the whenever we talk of urban centers or even when we talk about the rural settlements we look at the sedentary society in the sedentary in a sedentary society there are two broad types of settlement patterns the villages essentially the site for agricultural and some rudimentary craft activities and then the non agrarian sector is the site for cities and towns now in the history of the subcontinent i shall uh, speak mainly about the history of cities say from 600 bc to about 1300 ce almost a journey of 2002 millennia i'll leave out the first experience of cities in the subcontinent in the form of harappan civilization in the third millennium mid third millennium bc to the early second millennium, millennium bce and a very famous large scale riverine civilization in fact this is the largest bronze age civilization in terms of its uh, extent having major cities both in in this india and also in pakistan 
consisting of a major uh, large cities and also smaller towns. I'm not going into the details of it. And what is most interesting is the telltale evidence of not only the remains of the cities, but distinct traces of town planning, the elaborate drainage system, the permanent structures made of brick, public buildings, the use of some kind of a writing system, though we do not know the, the actual language of the script of the seals, variety of crafts and far-flung commerce, a fairly definitive weights and measure systems. If this, these were the hallmarks of the Harappan civilization, then say from about mid second millennium BCE to about 700 BCE, the period represented in Indian history and culture as the time of the Vedic corpus, cities virtually disappeared. The elaborate city system that was essentially an experience of the northern and northwestern part of the subcontinent, mainly in the western and northwestern part of the subcontinent, is not in any continuation after 1800-1700 BCE. Then cities once again became visible, but this time from a different zone, not in the western and northern western part of the subcontinent, but largely in the Ganga Valley from around 600 BCE. Therefore, the cities of the 600 BCE will be considered as the next phase of urban development, and therefore the level second urbanization is applicable here. And when second urbanization uh, appeared, it does not come in isolation. We are not trying to see merely a list of cities or the description of cities. Uh, we are trying to understand the process of the emergence of cities, their spread, their growth, and if there were images of their decay or new forms coming out from the second urbanization. We are trying to look at that process. That's why I have used the term urbanization rather than giving merely a list of cities. Now, urbanization is a complex process. It, in the context of the second urbanization, it emerged in conjunction with the emergence of the first territorial polities, the first metallic currency and the rise of heterodox religious groups that challenged the, the supremacy, the unchallengeable position of the Vedic ideology. These heterodox religious groups were Buddhist, Jainas, Jainas, the followers of Ajivika uh, religion, the Charvakas of the Loka, the materialists. And then the, ur the urban impulse also was further uh, connected with the writing system, which became evident to us, say, from 3rd century BC with the coming of the Ashokan inscription. Now, the second urbanization, interestingly, starts in a different geographical zone, not in the Indus plains of the Indus system, but in the Ganga Valley area. And it is from the 600 BC to 300 BCE, it is largely a North Indian experience, not a subcontinental experience. Say from 200 BCE to 300 C, it urban centers proliferated over the very large area, nearly pan India. I have also uh, in mind, the hallmarks of the city, culture, city life, 
it is seen as a marker of change. The rural areas are distinct from the urban areas in several points because the urban, the, as I said, the urban sites are essentially located in or connected with the non-agrarian sector, but these are never cut off from the agrarian milieu because the agrarian uh, milieu will provide the essential resource in terms of food to the non-agricultural inhabitants of the city area. And the city is usually much larger than a rural settlement and population is larger the density of population is also much more dense than we ex ex expect in a rural area since the urban areas are also sites of the convergence of diverse groups of people urban society is accommodative of diversity therefore more open and because of the accommodation of diversity it is also much more complex than the rural settlements it is from about 700 bce in an upanishadic text the term nagara in the sense of a city first appears the other synonymous term we know it is pura in sanskrit literature and the pura and nagara are often differentiated from grama which is the site of a village it apparently these two are contrastive categories but there is actually a, a continuum between from one end the grama to the other end that is Nagara through the Nigama, which are often the smallest settlements of professionals, usually craftsmen, artisans, and to some extent of the merchants. And this, the Grama Nigara, Nigama Nagara, this triad is located, is to be seen in the, from the point of view of a sedentary settlement of society, the Janapada, which is a lived space there it is not an empty space it's a lived space now of the cities the 600 300 bce phase witnessed the emergence of cities mostly in north india uh, the accompanying map i'm sorry for a little bit faded image but it will immediately show even by the names of the cities of dots that there is a heavy cluster a concentration in the ganga plains and most concentration in the middle ganga basin there is the only three cities are outside this concentrated area of ganga plains the areas of taxila in anchar sadda the peshawar region in the Indus system and beyond the Ganga Valley and the very major city of Ujjaini in present-day Madhya Pradesh. How we know about these Mahanagaras, these Nagaras? It, the list of cities appears in a canonical Buddhist text the Mahapurinibbana Suttant of the Dighanikaya, the scene is the Buddha is about to die. And Ananda, his very favorite disciple, laments that Buddha is about to die in a very inconsequential, small, nondescript city, a town that is Kusinagara, near about the present day Gorakhpur region. And Ananda wishes that the Buddha could have chosen to breathe his last in one of the six great cities and Mahanagaras. And these Mahanagaras are clearly separated from what is called smaller cities or towns called Shakhanagar. And the list from in the, in the 
in the Diganikaya, Mahaparinibbana Suttanta is Champa, Rajagya, Rajagraha, Shravasti, Saketa, Koshambi, and Varanasi. These are the six Mahanavaras. We shall combine the study of urban centers, particularly of the time between 600 BC and 300-400 CE, by combining the textual descriptions with the field archaeological findings. I would like to say the field archaeological evidence is not merely to be seen as corroborative of the textual descriptions. First of all, the Buddhist texts did not, did not have any particular urge to describe cities. The Buddhist texts were dealing with something else, how to get rid of dukkha or sorrow in the world. So their prime interest is not to describe cities. They are, these are incidental notices and some of and in many places, the textual descriptions are stereotypical. Whether it is Varanasi or Champa or Kushinagara, more or less all the cities are described in a hackneyed manner. And therefore, the greater temporal and spatial specificities found in archaeological context, we must take this into account to check verify, juxtapose, compare between the textual and the archaeological perspectives. We start with Taxila in the Bhid Mound area and one can immediately see the brick structures and then I've given very uh, just synoptic images of three major cities. One the ramp on the left hand side the rampart wall almost like the shape of a rhomboid at Ujjaini, then the very massive city walls of Koshambi on the, on, the, on the right hand top and the right hand below, the Cyclopean wall running for nearly 40 kilometers around the city of Rajagriha, the capital of Magadha Mahajanapata. And Rajagriha, in addition to the Cyclopean wall, has natural fort, uh, security as it's a hill girt city surrounded by hills on fives, five hills. Now the fortification is one of the principal marker that distinguishes the city from rural areas. In the list of cities, I'm not going into the reading out the list of cities. We have already talked about the six great cities. In the early Pan Buddhist Pali canonical text, in the list of six cities, one city is missing. That is Pataliputra, the largest city and the famous capital of the Magadha Mahajanapada and later of the imperial capital of India with the coming of the Mauryas. Now what happens? In the same Dighanikaya story, Mahapurinibbana Suttanta, we do not hear about Pataliputra but Pataligama. By Pataligama, it is not to be considered merely as a grama or a village. It is described as a Puta Vedana, kind of a place where lids, Puta, of boxes of merchandise were broken, that is open. That's why it's called Puta Vedana, kind of a stockade or wharf, standing at the confluence of the Ganga and the Sona, Son River. The Buddha, on his final journey to Vaishali and then towards Kushinagara, passed through this Puttabhedana and made a prophecy of its future greatness at the Agganagara or the premier city in the whole of Jambudvika. The term Puttabhedana obviously speaks of the commercial significance of this kind of a site and similar uh, commercial centers but gradually emerging as a full-fledged urban center is available in the Arthashastra, which, which speaks of Panyaputabhedana and the story of King Minandar, 
in his Milinda Pahiha, which also speaks of his capital Sagala as a Nana Panya Puta Bheda. Later, in the classical Sanskrit lexicon, Amarakosha of the 6th, 5th, 6th century, the term Puta Vedana is no longer distinct from a Nagara, but is considered a synonym of Puru and Nagara. This is how the meanings of technical words change. Interestingly, as I said, the cluster of cities are mostly in the Ganga Valley. Take, for example, the burgeoning of cities, the growing number of cities in the Kanpur district of Uttar Pradesh. At the painted gravel level, there were only 46 sites. At the northern black polished ware level, which is coeval with the city life and this luxury pottery connected with urban centers in North India, by about 600 BCE to 300 BCE, the northern black polished ware sites in Kanpur district becomes more than double 99. Similarly, in Allahabad district, where lies the great city of Koshambi, which has the size of 50 hectares, then below it, the site of Sringaverapura and Kara, each of the size of 12 hectares, and then two other smaller size of six hectares each. And there are numerous smaller size ranging between almost half to two hectares. And now there is a clear hierarchy of settlements. At the apex is Koshambi, then at the lowest are the much more numerous smaller sites almost presenting the immediate what is called technically the umland and the near about hinterland of a very large city like Koshambi. This will be the supply zone of both the raw materials, artisanal productions, and also the food supply of for the great city of Koshambi. Uh, this is the Koshambi, the excavated area. As we know, there has been a debate regarding the spread of our, our urban centers in the Ganga Valley with the availability of our improved iron technology, particularly the use of the iron plow, share, and also the other iron agricultural implements, which led to the availability of the crucial agricultural surplus with which large cities full of non-agricultural inhabitants, they could be sustained. Now, this was proposed by Didi Kosambi and R. Sharma, also with uh, by a number of uh, other archaeologists. And they pointed out that the Singbum Chotanagpur area, very close proximity to the Magadhan state, was a major area of iron deposit. And therefore, Magadhan zone, a nearby area, could access the iron ore led to the widespread use of iron technology in agriculture, which sustained the cities with the agrarian surplus. This was, this created a debate with an alternative position that surplus is essentially not merely a technological output with the better availability of better iron technology, Surplus is essentially a political administrative demand articulated by a power structure. And in this case, the power structure were the Mahajanapadas. The, the problem is, first of all, iron tools can be, the use of iron tools can be pushed back, even almost to the mid second millennium BC. That did not immediately lead to a dramatic process of urban development, it took, it did not take place before 600 BC. And take for a, uh, the sites of Atranji Khera, no, both very large and definitely of urban proportion have yielded very large number of iron tools, but these are mostly weapons, not iron tools for production purposes, particularly agricultural purposes. Very 
Few and handful number of actual iron plowshares have been found from this time. And take, for example, the entire peninsula, the trans vindian area, archaeologically have, are associated with iron technology. But that did not lead immediately to the emergence of urban center beyond the Ganga Valley. It is very significant to note that the area of first urban, second urbanization and the area covered by the territorial polity of the Mahajanapadas more or less match. The urban period from 200 BC to 300 CE, the 505 centuries, saw remarkable urban proliferation. What was essentially a North Indian and largely Ganga Valley experience now spreads to various disparate regions of the subcontinent. Older cities continue and reach their most flourishing phase, like the great cities, Koshambi, Shravasti, Mathura, Varanasi, Ujjaini, Taxila, etc. And the areas where we never saw cities before, like Bengal, Orisha, Deccan, and Tamilakam, the far south, we find both textual and field archaeological evidence of the emergence of cities for the first time beyond Ganga Valley. So, and the areas beyond the Ganga Valley where urban centers appear for the first time after around 200 BCE, they are often modeled on the basis of or get the primary impulse from the Ganga Valley urban centers or the model of urban layout in the Ganga Valley urban centers. So if the Ganga Valley urban centers of the time of the Buddha and the Mahajanapada are seen as expressions of primary urban centers, so the later ones beyond the Ganga Valley would be considered as secondary urban centers. And this coincide with the formation of secondary state system in the Deccan and also in, uh, in say, Western India, Central India, also in the Central Western Deccan. As we find, the, and the main point here would not be merely the number of cities, Bidhi Chattopadhyay makes us conscious about the crucial factor in the cityness of the city. That is, a city being large and offering diverse functions must have a differentiation and organization of the space of the city for different purposes and different types of inhabitants. So it is not merely the large size of the cities or the profusion of archaeological evidence that make a site as a marker of urbanity. It is the differentiation of the space and organization of the space in terms of the differentiation, which speaks of the multifunctions, multiple functions available within the urban space. And greater the multifunctionality in an urban space, it will be a more prominent and more important city in urban hierarchy. This is Taxila in the northwest. And we have seen that I'll go very quickly. This reaches its most prosperous phase within the five centuries, opening towards the northwestern frontier area and connected with the Central Asian Silk Road. Similarly, the city neighboring in the neighboring zone of Taxila, Pushkalavati or Chasabda, Pukelautis, to the west of the river Indus is another great city and reaching its flourishing stage at the Shakakushana phase. Interestingly, at this Pushkalavati, apart from I'm not getting into the details on the right hand side, you can see the layout of a uh, of a habitational structure, an ordinary house. And 
Interestingly, Pushkalavati also is associated and known for its city goddess, Amba, the great mother. And she figures in a coin shown as the city deity of Pushkalavati. Then Mathura. In the Doab region, Ganga Yamuna Doab region, it is the it is the capital of the Surashana Mahajanapada, known in the Anguttara Nikaya, but was actually scorned in the Anguttara Nikaya in, as a say around 300 200 BCE as a very poor quality city. Major transformation comes in the five centuries, particularly during the Shakakushana phase in the history of the city when it was a major political center of the powerful Shakakushana rulers. And naturally, therefore, its lively linkages with the Northwest. Mothura actually has only one uh, artisanal product, so as to say, which is typical of Mothura, that is Shatika, from which the word Sari is, is derived. And this is the only major product Mothura offers. Yet, Mothura's nodal position, along with the, its role as a political center and a very major cultural center, leads to its blossoming. Interestingly, the Lolita Vistara, a Buddhist narrative text of 2nd, 3rd century CE pays glowing praise of the city of Mathura and indicates the city derives its prosperity mainly through trade, which once again harps on its position as a node in a number of a node of the overland network system. The accompanying image, a stone sculpture, shows lofty towers in the gateway of the city of Mathura with different superstructures of the building, including one, a gable vaulted roof of a structure. The different types of uh, housing and superstructures. And Mathura is definitely a, an urban center marked by multifunctionality, a premier political center, a major commercial center, and Mathura is known as a convergence point of, a, of several religious groups and a very major art center for art activities. We would now like to look at an area which for the first time experienced cities, Bengal. The earliest known urban center, and Bengal, we have the city of Pundranagara, nowadays Mahasthan, in northernmost part of northern part of Bangladesh, then Bangar, what is later known as Koti Varsha in West Bengal, then Wari Bhatisha, very close to Dhaka. These three cities have come into existence by around 300 BCE, more or less coeval with the Mauryan times. Then later, in the 200 BCE, 300 CE, we find Mongol court in present day Bordhavan district, Kotasur also in the Rala area, and Chandragatugar, a neighboring region from Kolkata. These are also new cities. And then in the Medinipur region, the very famous port city of Tamralip. This is Mahasthangar Pundranagara, the excavated site, and also known from the inscription, the Brahmi inscription, calling it Pudanagara or Pundranagara. And this is the structure, the brick structure at Chandragutagar. It's a, it's a riverine port area noted for its flourishing seaborne commerce, particularly represented by unique five, sea, five ship designs on terracotta ceilings. Once again, like Bengal, the neighboring region of Kalinga, Orissa, sees 
the emergence of a very impressive city at the site of Shishupalgar near present day Bhubaneshwar, square in shape, in layout, with impressive gateways, it is possibly identifiable with either Ashoka's Toshali or Kalinganagari, in which figures in Karavela's Hathigumpa inscriptions. We see, if we go to the Deccan, and please keep it, we have to keep it in mind that Odisha is a, a corridor zone between North India and the Deccan Peninsula India, like also the corridor zone standing at Western Malwa around the city of Ujjaini. These two are two flanks which prove the conduit between North India and the peninsular part. In this area, in the central Deccan, we come across the city of Pratishthana, Paitan, which was the Satavana capital, also a textile production center, as mentioned by the Periplus of the Eritrean Sea. And we see the, uh, some excavation, the scene of the excavated remains of Paitan. In the Karnataka area, Gulbarga district, the well known Buddhist site, large site of Sannathi in Karnataka, and then in the eastern Deccan. I have, I have made only select selected list of sites, the very famous site of Vijayapuri, known from the Ikshwaku inscriptions and represented by the massive site of Nagarjuna Konda in coastal Andhra, which has revealed the city layout, the habitational structure, the center for religious activities. And here I have chosen a sporting arena, an amphitheater-like structure. And this structure definitely speaks of its contact with the Mediterranean Greco-Roman world, because amphitheater as a sporting arena is not indigenous to the subcontinent. And this accommodation of diversities of non-local features is typical of an urban center. If we go now to the deep south, once again, like the Deccan experience, Tamilakam also for the first time witnesses urban centers but not like Deccan, the widespread visibility of cities can be seen. If we look at the description of cities in the earliest known Tamil literary composition, the Sangam poems, it speaks of cities only in two of the five eco zones which are called Tinez. and those cities are found in Natal or Natal which are the coastal areas and Marudam fertile river valleys and this is the large number of uh, cities are found many cities are found in these two zones but not in the relatively drier region not in the areas which is which are suitable to pasture pasturing activities or to the hilly tracts. So the experience of city life in Tamilakam is are limited to these two areas only. And both the areas, that is the Nadal and the Marudam zones, were open to trade networks, including long distance trade networks. And we, sh we know that this is the time when maritime contacts with the Mediterranean area, Eastern Mediterranean area, through the Red Sea network, through Socotra, these areas were connected with the, both the coast, coasts of the Deep South. And there are indications of the impact of the Roman 
trade and Roman and the Mediterranean elements in the excavated remains of some of the coastal sites. Therefore, Champagalakshmi, who made very major studies of the South Indian cities in the early phase, pointed out that there was a limited experience of city life in deep south in the Tamilakam and it was limited essentially to the coastal and the fertile river valleys but largely prompted by external stimulus in other words it did not take strong roots and did not spring up from the indigenous background Interestingly, there were at this time three major chieftaincies in the Tamilakam area, like Bengal, we do not come across a Mahajanapada like polity or a full fledged monarchical state polity. Yet, in both these areas, city life with the markers of urban culture, use of coin, long distance trade coincided. It does not match the experiences in other zones of the subcontinent. That's why we pointed out in the beginning, urbanization when we study has its distinct regional features. Interestingly, Tamilakam area is dominated during the period of the Sangam poems by three major chieftaincies. The Cheras on the, in the western part of Tamilakam, including the coastal Kerala region, the Pandyas in the present day Madurai region, and the Cholas in the Kaveri Valley and Kaveri Delta area. A common point is, Urban, all these chieftaincies had two major urban centers, one inland, one on the coast, like Karur and, 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 and the Muchiripattanam in West in the Kerala region, the area of Korkai, Kolchi, the coastal area within the Pandyan chieftaincy and the inner city of Madurai. Similarly, the, the Chola political center at Urayur and the Chola maritime city on the Kaveri Delta in the form of Kaveri Pattina. Now, this is a peculiar feature of twin cities in coastal and river valley areas in the deep south. I'll quickly show some excavated remains. This is Arikamedu near Pondicherry, Puducherry, a conical jar. This is the identified with the uh, Poduka Emporium of, Perip, of, uh, of Ptolemy and also represented as Poduke in the Periplus of the Eritrean Sea, noted for distinct uh, presence of the people from the Mediterranean Greco-Roman uh, cultural zone. And interestingly, the, the emergence of cities in the Tamilakam area leads to certain changes. This area prior to 100 BC or 200 BC are largely dominated by the what is called the megalithic burial culture and small farming, essentially rural and society to some extent, pastoral society, rudimentary crafts and artisanal activities. Then with the coming of the widespread trade, including maritime trade and the emergence of cities in the two zones, major production centers came up, like Kodumanal, 
near present day uh, area of uh, area of Coimbatore in the western part of Tamil Nadu. It, it turned into a very major production center for diverse types of uh, artisanal activities, including bead making. A major feature of urban way of life is the jewelry, the crafts, craft of the jeweler, and varied types of bead making, including metal bead and beads of precious and semi-precious stones, were produced, manufactured at this site of Kodumanal, which changed from a megalithic burial site with typical black and red where pottery into a bustling artisanal production center. Now 600 BC to 300 CE or 400 CE, with this we have two major phases, 600, 300 BC, cities are there but essentially North Indian experience. 300, 200 BC to about 300, 400 C, these five, six centuries, cities become pan India with the primary urban centers and the secondary urban formation. Then there is a very major debate among several historians regarding the perception of urban decay after 400 CE. This was first seen uh, through the travel accounts of Xuan Sang, who often talked about the declining and worn out character of a number of major cities in the North Indian uh, area, particularly the upper part of North India, there are a number of cities which were well-known Buddhist sites were in a declining condition. With that, were combined archaeological evidence of several North Indian cities in their impoverished character in the form of the reuse of old building materials, utilization of old bricks, the less prosperity of the material condition of former urban centers in the post 400 CE days. It was also pointed out that if the some cities continued, these were essentially military camps or Jaiskandabaras, figuring in inscriptions, or merely centers of pilgrimages, Tirthas. Cities almost became indistinguishable from rural settlements. I recall at this moment a particular cite, citation by BNS Yadava who pointed out that in a Jaina tale, the cities are being described as almost indistinguishable from villages. Is it a phase of urban anemia? This is exactly the expression used by Arish Sharma, followed by BNS Yadava and several others. This is a fairly well-known position. Let me go through quickly. They pointed out that urban anemia, and please, we have to note the expression anemia, which is actually a disease condition. And therefore, social, economic, and political scenario was possibly, at least according to this perception, was in the grip of some disease, not in good health. And it was coupled in Sharma's perspective with monetary anemia, say from 300 to 1000 CE, particularly from 500 to 1000 CE, this five centuries. The period marked, according to the perception of urban anemia, 
unprecedented rural expansion, both because of the gradual decay of urban centers and also the rural expansion possibly uh, resulted in the gradual disappearance or the lesser importance of cities as a habitational space. This was largely because of the numerous grants of revenue free lands to religious persons and institutions called agraharas. I am not getting the details of it, but what appears that rural expansion and uh, urban contraction are contrastive formations. In fact, Sharma's very well-known book, Urban Decay in India, circa 300 to 1000 AD, actually has these two chapters on rural expansion and urban contraction. It was pointed out that the period from 400 CE to 1000 CE witness languishing trade, particularly long distance maritime trade, leading also to the absence of precious metal money. And this was hardly conducive to the sustenance of cities as an ideal theater for commerce and uh, manufacturing centers. So that also led to the lesser use of currency and therefore urban anemia combined with monetary anemia. Now there are problems of perspectives, also empirical issues in the portrayal of urban anemia. First of all, are we, should we always see the city, particularly in the subcontinent context, as essentially a consumption and manufacturing center? Or the cities should, can be seen alternatively as agro cities. This is an expression used by Horibishnu Sarkar in terms of the formation of cities in Andhra Pradesh, particularly Nagarjuna Kunda area and the cities around. Can agrarian expansion be considered as a hindrance to ex urbanization? This is a crucial question. Because even in the second urbanization, the phase from 600 BCE to 300 CE or 400 CE, particularly in the primary urbanization phase, 600 CE to 300 BCE, the crucial engine of change was agricultural development that ensured very substantial amount of agrarian resources and surplus with which the non-agricultural inhabitants of the city could be sustained. So how, and in the making of the first cities of the second urbanization, so as to say trade was not the primary factor in the making of the cities. So how a factor which is not a primary factor in the formation of cities can be pointed as the primary factor for the decline of the cities. On the other hand, this period from 300 to 1000 C have, has, is used unanimously seen as a period of unprecedented rural expansion. Now, if rural resources help the growth not only of rural settlements, but also conducive to the sustenance of non-agricultural settlements and non-agriculture, non-agrarian sectors of the economy, then how can it be detrimental to the making of urban centers, particularly in the 300,000 C phase? These are questions we have to answer. We have also to take into note that archaeologically speaking, not all cities were dwindling. Several North Indian cities belonging to the second urbanization phase show no decay, like Ahitchatra, Puranakila, Atranjikhera, Mathura, Varanasi. These are all in Uttar Pradesh. Chiram in Bihar, Bangar in West Bengal. At least in the sites, with, archaeologically speaking, 
where we have telltale signs of city life, not merely poetical, imaginative description of cities. There is no indication of contraction, decay, or desertion, or shrinkage in the existing pattern of the cities which began during the days of the second urbanization. So all cities did not die. Some cities did die for reasons, not because of a sweeping urban decay for other reasons. But these cities definitely continue. And then many new cities sprang up. Often, yes, often as political centers of newly emerging regional local powers. These regional local powers belong to the belong to the category of the locality level and regional state formation. Therefore, once again, state formation and emergence of new cities went hand in hand. We did not encounter cities like Thanesar, Kanauj, Anahilapura, Tripuri. Anahilapura in Gujarat, Tripuri is in present day Jabalpur area, Ramavati, the city of Rampal, established by Rampal in North Bengal, Pragyoti Shapura in Assam, Kamarupa, Kanchi in South India, Badami, the Chalukya capital, Manyakheta, the Rashtrakuta capital, Tanjavur, the great city of the Cholas, Warangal, associated with the Kakatiyas. We did not see this kind of cities. Even not a city around what is present in Telangana region, War Warangal, in, in the early period. So third, this, the spread of new foci of states, essentially regional, local in character, are coinciding with the emergence of new political centers in form of cities. And for this, we are deeply grateful to the analysis of B.D. Chattopadha. Even before 1000 AD, Chattopadha's classical, classic researches into epigraphic records spread before us the images of new cities. I would like to tell a particular point here inscriptions of the post Gupta times, that is from the 600 AD onwards, have been used by most of historians to look for the rural society, rural milieu inscriptions also generate data on urban way of life along with other kinds of textual narratives. This is Tattanandapura near Bulanshar in Uttar Pradesh. And in 10 records, within 35 years, it figures as a clearly Puru and Pattar, clearly terms to denote a city. And there are indications of high, wide road, narrow road, specific road leading to the marketplace, Hattamarg. And market in the eastern quarters, this is a crucial point that is that once again the marker of differentiated space eastern part of the city purbhatta pradesh and then dwelling houses along with that shops also a number of temples prithudaka which is pehoa in haryana as a city figures in a record of late 9th century where there is a major religious festival takes place at the time of a horse trade fair where people from diverse areas converge and mingle. Once again, different types of activities, not merely as a trade center, but offering various types of activities. That would mark out Prithuda Kopehua as a city. And another city, the Ganga Valley, C.R. Doni or C.R. Duni, known from inscriptions, dated, say, for the ranging in date from 60 years, six decades. So not merely a sporadic notice in inscription. Varieties of 
residential houses, habitational area marked clearly as Vastu area, then differentiated from the marketplaces and arrangements of streets within the city area. There's a kind of a layout emerges, which is Hatya Ratya, Banija Nija Ratya. And there we, the inscription records the presence of a salt dealer who is a hereditary salt dealer who has amassed considerable wealth and that's why he emerges at the city as a patron to several temples. <coughs> and there are also the presence of important administrators at Siaduni. Once again, let me repeat the image the Siaduni inscription give regarding the multifarious functions and therefore the differentiation of space and organization of space for the layout of this urban center. Different from this is Gopadri made modern Gwalior. Once again, inscription describing it datable for 875-76. It is essentially a military garrison town called a Kotta, almost indicating it's having a killa. And there are high ranking army officers called the Baladikrita, but also the city accommodates two marketplaces, Hattikas, caravan traders, Sartavas are present, and also oil millers, Toilikas. And immediately we can understand the linkage with the agrarian hinterland. After all, oil millers can function only with the availability of oil seeds, which is actually a cash crop. We would also like to touch upon here a new kind of marketplaces called mandapikas, literally meaning a covered pavilion, which survive in the present day expression mandi, in North Indian expression. These are usually a locality level marketplaces, but sometimes they are described as having urban proportion or very large size, Pattana Mandapika, Maha Mandapika. A classic case of the transformation of a settlement pattern is offered by a fascinating analysis of inscriptions by Bidhi this is about Noddula. Initially, a village, a grama, located almost equidistant from 12 villages, which form a cluster. Dwadasha Gramiya Noddula Grama. Then it becomes a Shulka Ilding Mandapika. In some later inscription, it's called a Pura, now an urban center. And finally, emerges as the political center of the Nadol Chahavanas from Nuddula, now the city of Nadol in Rajasthan. If we have the, the Mandapikas in North India, particularly in the Ganga Yamuna Dwab, also Gujarat, Rajasthan, Haryana, then in the Deccan, we have similar categories of locality level exchange centers which assume the character of small towns and provide the vital linkage between the agrarian sector and very large cities. These are called penta, pinta, penta in the Deccan, which survive in the present name endings called pet, Narayan pet, Kazi pet, Begum pet, like that. And Nagaram is seen typically in the in in the Chola realm in South India as a market center at the Nadu or locality level. We find epigraphic data on the movement of commodities at the Nagaram. Usually these are bulk commodities, including salt, agricultural products, daily necessity items. And the Nagaram is almost a node for both inter-Nadu exchanges and within the Nadu, that is the villages that are included under the Nadu intra-Nadu networks. 
please note that mandapikas are in northern india essentially western part of northern india gujarat rajasthan Raj uh, haryana west western part of the doab penthas essentially in the deccan nagaram in deep south pronounce regional character of these we know of the great city of tanjavur and there you have the twin cities kulamukkupalayarai which we come to know by the researches of champakalakshmi is a twin city palayarai the palace site with the chola palace site and the sacred center combining combining the the palayarai essentially is the is the city kudamukku area is the sacred center palayar as a palace center now the twin city close to tanjavur which is also a very major center of pilgrimage a religious sacred center the site for a monumental temple also a cultural center offered the image of multifunctionality in bengal we see neither mandapika nor penta nor nagar it is essentially a deltaic area so new types of inland riverine centers spring up specifically during this period like deva parvata identified with the very famous buddhist cultural site of mainamati lal mai excavated in kumilleri and bangladesh it is described as a sarvata bhadra settlement that is it is encircled by river shiroda khirnai of present times on which ply hundreds of boatmen therefore the applic the term sarvata bhadra is apt it could be approached from any four side or could have been adorned with four gateways in the inscription seners we find a new type of non rural peri urban settlements called chaturakas does it mean a converging point of four roads a kind of a, a kind of a, a convergence of four areas into a a new type of non rural settlements i am not getting into the details and mostly these are connected with some cities nagaras or puras and often close to the river bank i'll particularly talk about one such called betadda chaturaka what is this betadda chaturaka which is clearly described as having jannavi that is the ganga on its as its right hand as as its right hand uh, limit the on the right hand of the settlement is the river ganga jannavi purbe jannavi seema this is betor near howrah city of howrah it is at the confluence of the river saraswati and the ganga what started as betadda chaturaka will flourish in early 16th century as bator of the portuguese providing the crucial linkages between the very famous riverine port of saptagram sadgaon near in the hugli with the river ganga where the large portuguese ships would lay in anchor lie in anchor because they could not access the inland riverine connectivity up to saptagram so this kind of feeder uh, smaller cities are crucial for the sustenance of the larger ones and in other parts of we have typical political and large commercial centers in bengal like ramavati gaur which gaur which later also is known as lakshmanavati and nudia figuring in tabakati nasiri of the 13th century there is actually no dearth of urban centers but different kind of urban centers that's why bd chatterjee called it 
third urbanization, these cities did not depend on an epicenter. It did not model itself on the basis of a particular pattern experience in one part of the subcontinent, then the urban impulse radiating to different corners of the subcontinent. All these centers, all the cities and smaller towns, starting as Mandapikas, as Penthas, as Nagarams, as a riverine inland center like Devaparvat, are rooted to their respective localities, particularly rooted to their agrarian base and strongly linked with their immediate hinterland. There is no epicenter for the emergence of the cities of 600-1300 CE. Therefore, very aptly, Bidhi Chattopadhyay distinguish these cities from the cities of the earlier times between 600 BC and roughly 400-500 CE. This one millennium of six city development stands in sharp contrast to the experience of city life in the later times. I'll briefly touch upon the kind of urban life. It is not merely the center of commerce or political centers. And for this, one has to move away from the hardcore visible archaeological evidence to the flavor of the city and its culture, often in literature, particularly in the four satirical plays, drama, Chaturbhana, where a Sarvabhoma Nagara is described through the eyes of a, a beater who has been kicked by a artisan, and that's why the name Pada Taritaka. He moves around the city and the cityscape along with different types of different types of sounds from different quarters of the city can be captured. This cacophony, typical of the city life, is captured. And the quintessential literature is Vatsaya's Kama Sutra centering around the Kama culture, desire, enjoyment, including erotic enjoyment, erotic satisfaction. And this is, enjoyment is the first principal facet of Nagaraka's quotidian life. That is also there in Sudraka's Mrichakotika. Charudatta is a typical case. The city in this case, preeminent seat for royal power, a theater for enjoyment, and also the site of a number of very accomplished ganikas or cartilages. So entertainment, sports, and dalliance is are the hallmarks of city life. I'll quickly, this is captured in Dundin, but I'll quickly also show acrobats in play. This is the sculpture from Darashuram temple close to Tanjavur. Also, ram fights and gamblers. Two gamblers with two rams. The city is seen in various types of literature as very special for enjoyment of fine taste, of sophistication. That's why in the very opening act of Kalidasa's Malavikat Nivitram, there is a statement that in the presence of city, nobody goes to a village to assess gems. Pattane Sati, Grame Ratna Pariksha. Similarly, in Harshacharita Banavatta, once again in the opening section, it's considered as a fine literature, Subhashita, and the creation of lexicon, Ovidhan, Kosha, and the site of a royal treasury, Kosha, there is obviously a play of words, 
kosha can never be marked with ruralism it's called ogramnya nothing to do with rustic features and we can find also a reverberation of this theme in the well known devapala prashasti of vijayasan of the sena dynasty where it says that the vijayasan has given so much gifts to the poor brahmanas that the the wives of the poor rural brahmanas now receive training from the nagaris the city bred women shikshyante to get the taste of fine urban culture and taste of luxuries gems i would brief now conclude with going beyond the cities so far described mostly in inland areas i'm looking for maritime cities this maritime city expression is i borrow from ashindas gupta who applied it in the case of surat in 17th 18th century ashindas gupta found that the appalachian maritime city is apt to describe a city whose life depends on is oriented towards an adjacent maritime space it may not be immediately located on the shore or even the coastal area like masulipatnam like surat like kolkata these are not exactly close to the coast and definitely not open to a sea but the life of these cities are oriented towards maritime spaces and oshindas gupta also pointed out that maritime cities are open more open socially and culturally than inland urban center we see this in the case of say shudpara or sopara now a northern suburb of mumbai where the buddhist tales would indicate that the buddha was assess buddha's association there in this area as a master mariner the kubalaya mala a joino tale would describe a gathering and lively conversation among varied merchants banik meli at the same city similarly at kaveri pattinam in in the kaveri delta within the cholo area it's city the presence of different sectors presence of fisher folk along with merchants and the yavanas in one part of the city and also the palaces houses of elites along with the pyar along with the warehouses are combined in the kaveri pattinam which also accommodate yavanas interestingly in kollam area present a quilon in malabar coast in 849 when the local ruler granted some lands in favor of a christian church mar toma that is saint thomas church to so the syrian christians there as witnesses we find signatures to this grant which is written in malayalam but signatures of witnesses in arabic kufi script middle persian pahlavi and hebrew obviously indicating the convergence of arabic speaking muslims people from iran persians parsis and also hebrew speaking jews similarly pahlavi middle persian inscriptions are seen in the well known buddhist sites in at kaneri one second in north of sabab or mumbai and not very far up from sri sthanakar present thane a major port in the coastal konkan area we can also cite the case of sanjan in northern most part of konkan and maybe in the southern most sector of gujarat coast called samiana as a velakula also as sindan in arabic text in this area inscriptions if we combine if inscriptions and also the notices of arab arabic texts we find there were temples of devi dashami or durga adjacent to 
a Vaishnava shrine. Then they're noted by the presence of Tajikas, Arab merchants and administrations whose names were Sanskritized. And recent excavations at Sanjan also reveal the existence of distinct markers of Parsi religion and Parsi cultures who also figure in the contemporary inscription Parasikas distinct from the Tajikas. Finally, I'll go to Somnath in Kathiawar in Gujarat. Somnath is obviously a celebrated Shaiva sacred center and a tith. But it was Alberun in early 11th century first pointed out that Somnath also is noted for maritime activities conducive to voyages to Zanz, Zanzibar or East Africa. Somnath, often in our understanding, is associated with its destruction of the Ghaznavid raid of 1025-26. Did it die down? This is often the impression it's the end of Somnath. No, not at all. Two inscriptions of 1264 and 1287 from Somnath itself would indicate it is a thriving city and close to the coast, very clearly indicated in both the records. It maritime network with Hormuz in Persian Gulf, Sokotra in the Gulf of Aden, and very interestingly in Sanskrit, Masha Madina Dharmasthana, this is the earliest known Sanskrit epithets of Makkah and Madina, the greatest and most sacred sites in Islam. So the linkage of this city connected with the sea is very clearly seen. The place was actually visited by a Hormuzi ship owner, Nakuda Nuruddin Firuz, who with the help of local administrators and elite also procured land to construct a Mijigiti, a mosque in Sanskrit, located actually at the outskirts of the city Somnatha Deva Nagarabhajje, but resources for the mo mosque were arranged from various areas within Somnath. So the, the outskirts was well integrated to the city. An influential Pashupata priest, Somnath is at this in the 13th century, a thriving center of the Pashupata sect. The figure Pashupata priest is Tripurantaka, not merely a very well-known religious personality. He is also engaged in business. He owns shops. He purchased shops, hutters, out of his own purely earned money or wealth bivabo. He built three temples, five temples within the city. And he also had a prashasti written. This is the Chintra Prashasti of 1287. He had a prashasti written for him by a minister. So, and the description of the city in 1287 speaks of trade in non-local, local, daily necessity, luxuries, including grains and pulses, assemblages of craftsmen and professional groups, including malakars, sthapati, sutradhar, and panchakulika is a body of important local people, mostly merchants and artisans, in charge of municipal affairs. So this is a city not merely marked by a Shaiva sacred centers, once again, multiple functions and accommodating people of different faiths. If you have the, as a premier marker of a Shaiva Pashupata uh, sacred center, it also has temples of Vinayaka, Ganesha temple, also the worship of Sikottori Mata, a local goddess, possibly associated with the seafarers. And the inscription of 1284, informing us about the construction of the Mijigiti or the mosque in Sanskrit, 
by the patronage of the ship, the ship owner has four dating systems to mark the date. It's in Hijri 664, 1320 in Vikrama era, 945 in Balavi era, and 151 Simma Sammad. The very perception of diverse cultural traits are accommodated and promoted in this peculiar dating system recorded in this inscription. And most interestingly, the Hijri era, obviously connected with the Muslims, is described as the era of Rasulullah Muhammad, the bodhakar preceptor of the maritime people, no jana, devoted to Vishwanathan. Now, who is this Vishwanathan? That is captured in the opening lines of the 1264 inscription from Somnath. It is an inscription describing the construction and patronage to the mosque, the Mijigiti. So, like any other inscriptions recording sacred shrines, starts with an invocation to Allah with four remarkable epithets in Sanskrit. Vishwanatha, Lord of the world, Vishwarupa, universal, Shunya Rupa, this is the clinching identifier, formless, an iconic. And Lakshya Lakshya, since Allah is formless, he remains invisible, but also visible everywhere. So Somnath, as a maritime city, open in nature, cosmopolitan, adaptive of non-local cultural straits, along with the indelible stamp of its preeminence as a Shoiva sacred center. So when we take into account the cities of the 600, 1300 times, my plea is to look not merely for cities, big cities, what Brodel said, the sun cities, like New York, like Delhi, like Kolkata, but smaller cities represented by, at locality level, like the Penters, the Nagaras, a city like Nordula, and also the cities opened the opening up and connected with the maritime world of the Indian Ocean, the maritime cities of the subcontinent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hello? Hello. Good day. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. now I can hear you. Yeah, sure. Okay. Is, it, is it okay? Sorry. Yes, yeah, sir. It's okay. Yeah. 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 Shall, yeah. shall I now sure. switch off the shall I now switch off the PowerPoint? Uh, you can. Yes, now it's better. Okay. Uh, so uh, there are uh, some questions. Actually, a lot of yes. questions in the comments. Thank section. you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so, first question is uh, from Nandini Roy Chaudhary. She asks also, apart from the archaeological evidences of urbanization in areas of Bengal, are there literary anecdotes or references to these places? And of course, thank you, sir, for this wonderful informative talk. Uh, oh, of course. Take, for example, the wonderful description of the city and port town of Tamralipta in Dandid's Dashakumara Charita. Here, in, the, in this prose romance, Tamralipta is described as a Velakula. It is 
it is visited by is it is visited by vahitras a large ocean going ships at least he gives an Im impression that it the the ship carried yavanas i do not know if greco roman people from greco roman world would have visited tamrutan 7th century it looks a little bit far fetched but also the activities of pirates around the city and wonderful description of games acrobatics being done by a girl a, a woman called kondukabuti who is very proficient in jugglery with balls that's why she is called kondukabuti yes the description is very clear and one could find also a little bit in uh, high flown sanskrit court poetry the description of the city of ramavati established by uh, ramapala of the palar dynasty in the ramacharitam of sandhya karan Uh, this is from Pooja Jain. Uh, are there marked differences in urbanization strategies seen in different parts of India, especially north and south? It's an interesting question. Thanks. I think when one goes to the Transvindian part, that is the uh, from the Deccan due to, down to the deep south. unlike the landlocked north india the deccan and the, the deep south are open open to the coastal areas on both the flanks and therefore many of the cities major cities are found close to the coast or having linkages with the coast in the case of north india there are only two possible openings one bengal the other gujarat where cities could have an orientation towards the maritime space or at least large riverine communication and this is possible particularly in the area of the deccan and also south india take for example the situation in 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 tanjavur this is the chola capital and not far away from tanjavur is the premier port of uh, of the premier port of nagapattinam which has replaced kaveri pattinam of the earlier times now nagapattinam is the premier cholo port it figures even before the cholo the great cholo rule started by about 7th 8th century in the tamil bhakti literature of the poems of the nayanars and alavars as a port and then the, it becomes a focal point not only of a port activity but also the site of a major buddhist vihara chulamani vihara which came up at the request of the ruler from shri vijaya and the chola ruler acceded to the request for building up this buddhist monastery in a territory which is very much marked by the cholo rulers leaning to shaiva religion the diversities of maritime cities are more pronounced in the peninsular part particularly the deccan and definitely in the riverine delta areas uh this is from dhananjay vattacharya uh do you think that the decline in the volume of indo roman trade led to urban anemia in early medieval india no answer is very clear first of all there is nothing called indo roman trade this is a wrong appellation because india did, did not have any direct trade contact in any form with rome itself it had 
very sustained contacts with the Eastern Mediterranean even before Egypt came under Roman rule. One can talk of the Eastern Mediterranean and Indian Ocean trade contact, a part of which was formed, was a part of Roman Empire, particularly Egypt and some parts of West Asia. But Roman, first of all, urbanization of the early historical times between 600 BCE and 300 CE, 400 CE, largely came up because of the agrarian potentials of North India, the Deccan, and also in the river valleys of the deep south. And that actually led to the emergence and proliferation of urban centers. Trade plays a role, but only secondary to the, to, to the availability of enough agricultural resources. That's why, as I mentioned briefly, Hari Vishnu Sharkar, in the context of the making of emergence of cities in coast Andhra area, called it agro cities. Cities with a linkage to the agrarian sector. And this is typically, I'll give you an example even of the early, earlier cities, the most flourishing phase of urbanization in the early historic times. The places of, say, Nagarjuna Kondam, Vijayapuri, was not divorced from a place called Dhanya Kataka, is a major Buddhist center and urban center, but note the name of the place, Rice Bowl, Dhanya Kataka. And it is the spread of agriculture in Eastern Deccan, under the Satavanas, under the Ikshaka rulers, that laid paved the way for the emergence of a number of urban centers in the riverine deltas, in the Krishna Godavari riverine delta, the Vengi area of later times. So agriculture plays a major role. And so the trade was a factor, but not the primary factor in the making of the cities of the Mahajanapadas, also cities of the post mauryan times in greater parts of the subcontinent. So the absence of tr or the 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 languishing, which is also very debatable, very debatable. The long distance trade did continue, first of all. I'm not getting into the deep on the details of it, but Roman trade, the boom and slump of Roman trade did not affect the, the making of the cities because Roman trade, after all, did not restructure. Indian society and Indian economy. Uh, well, uh, this is quite a big question from Sapnava Mallik. Sir, as we all know that the beginning of early historical period in Indian subcontinent near about 187 BCE, while Mauryan Empire began to decline. But according to K. Rajan, the beginning of early historical period in Tamil Nadu is 400 BC with special reference to Kodumanal excavation. Sir, why the differentiation between the time phase of early historical period in Indian subcontinent and Tamil Nadu? Uh, let me respond to this. This period levels, first of all, are all uh, arbitrary and sometimes debatable. And for a vast subcontinent like India, can we have a meta narrative of a single period level applicable to the entire subcontinent? By that, we just erase out and iron out all regional variations. What is early historic? The early historic is associated with uh, agricultural. Uh, full-fledged agrarian society, different from subs subsistent agricultural production, emergence of state society, uh, burgeoning trade, and then urban centers, along with the arrival of coinage and writing system. This had already appeared 
in North Indian context by about 600 BC. So the early story would, in the North Indian context, would begin by 600 BC. In the case of South, the Deccan and the and the uh, and the Pens and and the Tamilakam area, it has a. There is no problem if it has a different chronological setting because the markers of what we call early historic can be seen in another part of the subcontinent in a slightly later period or even maybe earlier period. So the regional features of these periodic levels must be accepted rather than giving a subcontinental character to each and every periodic level. So that is, uh, and I don't think the early the early story begins in North India merely in 187 BC. No, if you look at the two famous works, one is Amalananda Ghoshe, the city in early historic India. Does it begin only from the post mauryan times of the decline of the urban centers, or also if you read the Archaeology of Early Historic India by Raymond Dolchin, Bridget Dolchin, Dilip Chakraborty, the Erdoshi, and uh, also uh, Robin Cunningham. They do not begin. It's from 2nd century BCE. They started from 600 BCE, maybe even slightly earlier, 650, 700 BCE. So the, it's not merely when what is the date, but what are the markers of our history? Why we use this periodic level? What changes the perceptible identifiable markers are there that would separate a particular time from its preceding and succeeding periods? That is the crucial issue. Uh, the next question is from Arpan Bayan. Sir, is it possible that in the post fourth century period, due to the rise of landed magnets, surplus was utilized more to sustain the luxurious lifestyles of these landed intermediaries, the Samantas, and not to sustain the urban centers which fostered the non agrarian sector? No, first of all, uh, I think you were, you were trying to link up the emergence of urban centers with the demand for luxuries. Yes, luxuries, plays, luxuries, exotics, non-local, high-value commodities have their consumers, connoisseurs, and markets. And those who deal in this will, of course, uh, have enormous wealth. But one has to keep in mind that luxuries are also accessible to the very few, the upper crust of the society. And if we look at our evidence, both epigraphic and textual, there are luxuries, but the most important commodities are also daily necessity products, including commodity uh, the exchange in grains, this is replete in South Indian inscriptions. The location of, say the Nottula. Nottula is not a center, a Mandapika meant only dealing in luxuries. Its location was at the center of 12 villages. And therefore, it starts as a node. And obviously, the rural products were exchanged at a convenient point, which is Nottula. It becomes an Mandapika. And then from Mandapika, it yields Shulko and gradually assumes the character of a Pura. I'll give you another example. The case of Bilhari, around early 11th century, located close to Jabalpur. This is, even nowadays, a forest tract area, close to the, the thick, dense forest in the vicinity of Jabalpur in Madhya Pradesh. In this inscription, there is a graphic description of a large mandapika, Pattana mandapika, where you have luxury commodities as 
horses and elephants, obviously for elite consumption, along with uh, black pepper, which is a non-local agrarian product. Black pepper is not locally available, along with green vegetables and like brinjal and leaves, shako bartaku. So, and at the city of Seattle, the person who looms large as a patron to the cultural activities of the city is an elite, of course, but he is basically a salt dealer. Salt is not at all a luxury product. It is an indispensable bulk commodity required by both the upper crust and the most ordinary people anywhere and please understand that not each and every village in India uh, yields two essential component even in rural life that is iron for making of agricultural implement and salt so even for these two gathering these two basic essential ingredients to life and livelihood the villages would require exchanges and the, actually, this question, I think, is ingrained with the basic notion that Indian villages are like islands, self-sufficient and enclosed. It's high time this idea is given up. Uh, the next question is from Goni Nunisa. Uh, so she asks, sir, what do you think about urban areas or towns? In Kamarupa Pragga Jyotisha, the Brahmaputra Valley, mentioned by Zhuan Zhang in the 6th, 7th century, what gave impetus to these areas for new towns or cities, as this region witnessed for first time cities or towns? Thank you very much uh, for taking us to the Northeast. When do we come across? the description of a flourishing city in the Brahmaputra Valley. In the accounts of Ivan Shuansang, who traveled through this area, also some epigraphic records of the Shalastamba Bormon dynasty and the description of Harsha Charita. This important political entity of Kamarupa in the all are in the seventh century. Prior to that, at least from the Ganga Valley point of view, in the Elabad pillar inscription, Samutra Gupta Kamarupa is seen as a Pratyanta area, a fringe, fringe from the point of a Ganga Valley. But by about the seventh century, the emergence of a regional polity, regional state formation has come into process by land grants, by agrarian expansion, and therefore the possibilities of resources and enough resources which could be exchanged. Brahmaputra is a fascinating artery of communication, and therefore the Records from epigraphic records from Assam would speak of the Brahmaputra as a conduit of riverine traffic, and particularly when the Brahmaputra meets the Meghna and uh, empties it into the easternmost part of the Bengal Delta, the availability of cowrie shells, which Bhaskar Burman makes a gift to Harshavardhana as a marker of their long-lasting friendship, how can Kauris be there in this area? It's a landlocked area. Kauris is a marine product. Kauris are neither native to Bengal nor to Orissa. These are brought from in shiploads from Maldives, brought to Bengal Delta and then taken riverine, inland riverine commerce to the interior areas of Brahmaputra Valley and Kauris 
are often connected with daily necessity exchanges of bulk products. This is itself an item of bulk transaction across the sea, but connected with the daily life of the people. And along with that, Kamarupa offers three floral monal products available from its enormous forest resources. One is the aloes wood, spoken very highly of in the Arabic uh, and Persian text on travel and geography, also in some inscriptions. The other is the rhinoceros horns, which is an exotic item coveted, obviously, for the elites. It's seen as an aphrodisiac. And then the yak tails, chamari, which is an essential ingredient in a number of Brahmanical rituals in the temples, but not locally available in each Brahmanical shrines. So this is, and yaks are actually available with the pastoralists, not with the settled villagers, ni neither with the urban residents. So these are the resources with the availability of a state structure rooted to the regions and regional local level resources. This paves the way for the political centers, also cultural centers, along with the movement of bhakti, the emergence of the Brahmana settlements and commercial potentials, particularly through the numerous rivers and preeminent among them being the Lohitya, the Prajatisha. Uh, Tiyasha Roy asks, Sir, it would be of great help if you could delineate whether such a cosmopolitan atmosphere of the Mahajanapadas that was accommodative of a diverse population and where heterogeneous religions were capable of challenging the orthodox Vedic authority could or could not contribute to the emancipation of women and the lower strata of the contemporary society. Very interesting question. Thank you very much. First of all, there is a very clear uh, cleavage. When the cities are, the first cities in the Ganga Valley are coming into prominence, the Sutra literature, I think it is Bodhana Dharma Sutra or Apostama, I forgot exactly, maybe Bodhana Dharma Sutra. Lays down that one should not visit cities, Nagaras, because in the Nagaras there is permanent Anadhyaya. Anadhyaya means non study of the Vedas. In other words, the cities represent to the orthodox codification of Brahmanical Vedic norms that city is an anathema. Vedic Brahmanical ideology is rooted to rural world, of the world of the peasant and household. The cities are not in sync with this ideology. On the other hand, Buddha, Mahavira, uh, Mankali Gosala Putta, they are all homeless ascetics wandering, but often preaching in the city or close to the city or spending their Vassabhasa's monsoon retreat in a city. Buddha's very favorite was Shravasti. The Enlightenment of Buddha is Sarnath, Murigadava, which is nothing but a suburb of the great city of Varanasi. So these Gnostic religions, which challenge the supremacy and uh, infallibility of the Vedas, and infallibility and the supremacy of the highest burden of the Brahmanas, they have a preference always for the urban areas. Now, interestingly, the 
in the urban areas, at least in the patronage to some of the cultural centers, premier cultural centers, I'll mention two. The, the donors at Sachi, Kakanago, not a major urban center, but it's a place where people converge from various places, including from uh, deep in Maharashtra, close by from uh, in Madhya Pradesh area, also from the Ganga Valley, from the Doab, even from uh, even from Pundravardhana area in Bengal. So this is a place which could act as a node. Who are the patrons? There are 630 inscriptions recording donation to the great stupa at Sachi. Only three are royal donations. The rest are by non-royal people. Many, except those who are Brahmana donors, none refer to their jati or bodhna. And we also come across as donors, women often as someone's wife, also as shrabikas, as shishini, as female disciples. We do not now know what was their resources to make an act of patronage. After all, patronage requires resources. Only when you have some resource, you can part with a portion of that resource for the patronage. But patronage usually allows an upliftment or improvement of status. When one offers patronage, it is with some tangible. When the because of the patronage, one's status improves, it's a little bit intangible. So it may not immediately be available in the case of the downtrodden. But take, for example, Buddha's demise at Kushinagara. His last meal was offered by Kamakara Chunda, a blacksmith, offering food. Now, food is considered, partaking of food is considered as a marker, the hallmark of the Bodhnojati system. Buddha, after the Khatya, he accepts food from a Kamara, a blacksmith. So that helps breaking down of the Vodnojati norms. I'm not telling Buddha was able to establish an egalitarian society, but at least the visibility of the relatively lower order in the society are is there a shamanic order. I would also mention a thing a a, a donative record at Mathura, where a donor to the Jaina establishment categorically calls us a Ganika, a courtesan. Her mother too was a courtesan. She does not hide it. She makes enormous amount of donation. Fabulous, which shows that she has enormous wealth at these areas. And if you compare that with the description of the house of the Ganika, a very accomplished person, unlike most of the Kulabodhus in the Sanskrit literature, the Ganikas appear prominently in the urban context. How far urban society would allow for the amelioration of the distresses of the lower order and of the women is difficult to ascertain. At least take, for example, Kama Sutra, which speaks so much of the Nagaraka's ways of life, celebrates his dalliance and his merrymaking. The wife of the Nagaraka is almost invisible and is actually nothing but a Patibrata type of a lady, even in the Kama Sutra.
uh so this is our last question sir thank you for this enthralling talk i missed the first part of a lecture so my question is can the influence of long distance trade be totally ignored on third urbanization especially in south india the influence of bay of bengal china sea trade and china sea trade yeah the, the, nobody can deny the importance of trade and marit when i'm talking about the maritime cities as a category of urban centers obviously the maritime profile of the cities have to be taken into consideration and maritime profile has a clear orientation to maritime trade but maritime trade also does not always constitute long distance trade coastal trade is extremely vital and in fact more long lasting it is sedate less spectacular but it is the lifeline take for example as i mentioned of uh, of somna which did have connection with hormuz in persian gulf with masha madina in the, the in in the red sea network and possibly also socotra but somnath also has a regular connection of piously through the west coast network by the visit of ships from the goa rulers gopakapattana to someshwar in their own ships so maritime profile need not always mean only i repeat only long distance trade but long distance trade definitely plays a role in making of cities with a maritime profile take for example the city i do not know exactly how they configured say the city of chattagram sudkawa as ibn batuta mentioned it's a port town it's a maritime city and close to that area is the island of he mentions an island which is nothing but sandweep where resided according to ibn batuta people from innumerable places obviously they came for trade and there is the diversity of culture and this is an area even nowadays today in bangladesh the only pocket of buddhism this is one of the lasting pockets of buddhism even in the 12th 13th century now we know that in this zone with the the eastern part of the delta by 11th late uh, mid 12th century came up a shrine for the worship of allah by a predominantly vaishnava ruler bhojo varman in 1145 in the form of allah bhattaraka swami in a sanskrit inscription and this was an area also steeped in buddhism so and it speaks of the presence of paradeshikas whose bihar would be sustained by the shulka from a hatta once again the trade network obviously paradeshikas would have come by the sea so long distance trade do play a, an important role if we talk of maritime cities so i believe uh, that's all for today uh it's, it's always a pleasure to hear you sir uh, and uh, many many thanks for accepting our request and for this wonderful lecture uh, we have never hoped we have uh, arranged for this we can uh, just imagine it <laughs> so no, it is i must come to uh record my most sincere thanks and appreciation to the organizers i understand these are very young fellows nothing to gain that this kind of discussion sessions can be organized without any sense of gain or immediate advantage is something unbelievable in the days of crass commercialization through which we live now everything is market oriented at least you have thrown it out through this kind of lecture series and you have helped me also graduating through this process of 
interacting to the audience, very lively audience. My most sincere thanks to all the question uh, questions posed by the audience and that I'm able to interact in this COVID world through this online network. At least we are connected. We are not disconnected. And once again, what better the urban centers offer than constant, undiminished, sustained contacts, convergence, sometimes with contestations also, negotiations. But the urban centers are like that. And I recall a German saying of the typical medieval Germany when cities were coming up. After the end of the medieval, they said, Stad Luft macht frei. The city air makes you free. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor, again. Uh, so to those uh, uh, who have uh, joined our session here on Facebook, thanks to them also. And the questions that still remain unanswered, Professor Chakravarti shall try to answer some of them, uh, I guess. So we shall uh, contact the uh, questionnaire later, of course. Uh, so that's all for today. Uh, before summing up the yeah. whole session. Yeah, sure. So. Himadri, uh, yes, if uh, the, some of the members of the audience feel to uh, raise questions beyond this session, they are free to write to my email. Please pass on to them my email. And uh, if there are questions, it will be much easier for me to give specific answers in writing rather than kind of long ramblings as I've done also in the, in the also in the question answer session. And I may have once again taxed your patience and do please excuse me for that. I, I tend to be careless a little bit in this kind of a discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, okay, sure, sir. So we'll post it on the comment box later, actually, uh, I guess. Uh, yeah, so, so uh, that's all for today. Before I sum up the whole session, I have an announcements, uh, announcement to make. Uh, our next session will be hosted on 8th of September, where Professor Shivasi Chatterjee shall talk on international order, imagined uh, uh, contestation of Sorry for that. Uh, my apology. I guess uh, so. Please join the session too. I guess uh, all those who are watching it now shall join us for the next session also. And thanks everyone to Professor Chakraborty again, to all the viewers and also the whole team uh, for arranging this lecture. So that's all. Good evening and stay well, stay safe, everyone. Thank you very much.